what's up it's h1 and we're about to be running it back with another episode talking about how to attack the castle king i'm going to give you some tips and tricks on what to think about while attacking the castle king and basically some secrets that aren't in every book you're gonna learn it here from h1 nobody else is going to do that for you oh my goodness wow 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 (laughs) well i'm just glad that you can be here we're gonna keep on learning about chess knowledge chess wisdom chess understanding and let me just say if you want more chess knowledge chess wisdom chess understanding my youtube chess knowledge with h1 has that um you can follow me on instagram h1 chess or my facebook group Chess Knowledge with H1. I'm about to be doing something special there. So follow that if you want some more like updates in the chess world on there. Because I just gave out a big secret. But anyway, let's get into it in next segment. Hey, this is Chess Knowledge with H1, and the sponsor of today is Anchor. You know what? Have you ever wondered, man, I just want to talk and talk, and I want people to listen to me, and I don't even know where to start. Well, H1 would suggest Anchor. First of all, it's free. They have their own creation tools so that you can record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And now they have this like new feature where you can add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. And plus, one of my favorite features, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so you can hear yourself on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or many more stations. And then, plus, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum leader. What is it? What's the word? Listenership. Yeah, I almost messed that up. Okay. And then it makes everything simple for you since everything is in one place. So this is the thing. If you want to start your podcast right now, Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get it started. Anchor.fm to get started. Thank you for listening, guys. H1 out. Okay, H1 is here and we are going to get into the lecture. But before we get into how to attack the castle king, I want you to do this for me. Do this for H1, from the heart, okay? Think about the Castle King. Visualize the Castle King, or set up one. Set up one on a board. And think about what it normally looks like. What pawns are usually in front of the king? King side or queen side? And what piece is beside the Castle King? It's normally the rook, right? So you're gonna have to visualize the Castle King during this episode. Uh, to stick with me on how to attack the castle king and this is kind of a test run on what i want to do in the future so if you really like this then hey give me a thumbs up you know give give me a good review but anyway anyway stop begging h1 um so i'm mostly going to be playing against the black pieces so i'm going to be playing on the white side because white has significantly more chances to attack black than the other side so I need you to visualize a castled king with no pawns pushed up and the rook still beside the king. And remember this because like when I'm going through these principles, I, I want you to like keep this in mind and like think about weaknesses. And I- I'm-, I'm about to get onto the episode, but yeah, just remember, think about the castled king and like have the right formation on the board or visualize it because I'm going to be going deeper onto how to break through the castle king too. Okay. So there we go. Let's get into the next segment. This is the waiting room segment, Chess Jokes by H1, and the joke of today is, 
I'd like to buy this chess set, please. How will you be paying, sir? Check, mate. Thank you for listening. Okay, let's get straight down to business. So before I get into this, I want you to remember this principle. Remember this principle. Good. Because attacking is not just this easy thing that you can just do. Okay? You can't just do it. It has to come about. So you can either write this down or remember it. I don't care. You know you can always listen to me. Or you can repeat this however you want. But it's easier to attack when you have a superior position, so you should take the opportunity to gain an advantage. Usually when you don't take the opportunity, your opponent surely will. I will repeat this. It's easier to attack when you have a superior position, so you should take that opportunity when you do have a superior position than your opponent. Because if you don't, then it will go away. You will not see it if your opponent is a good opponent. So don't don't be a coward. If all your pieces are rocking and rolling, and you're castled, and you have the center, and then you do some passive move after that, that's not what the position was calling for. No, it's, it wasn't calling for that. It was calling for you to attack. So let's get into it. How to attack the castled king. So first of all, I just want to say that there are, there are two ways to attack the castled king. There is a peace attack or a pawn attack. These are the two ways to like start a attack. So the peace attack is usually with just the major and minor pieces only. Usually these attacks begin with a sacrifice. So if you think about the Greek gift sacrifice, it begin with a bishop sacrifice. Um, you have to be more precise about the initiative gained from the sacrifice because you most likely will be down a piece. But there are ways to tactically attack your opponent than to fully sacrifice a piece. Now, the piece sacrifice could be um, dangerous because when you sacrifice a piece, you, you can't just get it back. You have to really calculate you know, what you're doing when you're sacrificing a piece, because you don't want to um, equalize. You want to have a winning position after it, or at least have some initiative over it. You have to have like an, like a good element, more space, more quality, more something so that you can compensate for that sacrifice of that peace attack. So to set yourself up for a peace attack, you have to make sure your pieces are directed towards the king. If all of your pieces are on the queen side and you're trying to attack your opponent that's castled on the king side, it probably isn't the right time to even think about that. You probably shouldn't even be doing that at all because you should be attacking where you're the best at, you know, the area that you're already controlling. Don't attack where you're nowhere to be found in. So remember this principle. It's best to have four to five pieces to have a successful attack. And I know I keep on repeating this, but it's important. I want to drill this in your head so that the next time you're thinking about, oh, snap, I, I want to attack the king because I have a superior position. And then be like, oh, snap, I only have two pieces. I can't just attack with a queen or knight, especially if my opponent is good. So let me get some more artillery. Let me get some more friends in the, in the mix. You know, you can't have a birthday party without your mama. You know what I mean? So <laughs> in order for you to have a successful attack, you have to have four to five pieces. Um, it's best to have four to five pieces. You can have like an attack with less, but it's best to have four to five pieces to have a successful attack. It's definitely important to recognize all of your forcing moves. And remember, forcing moves is all of your checks, 
captures, and threats. You never know until you check for that sacrifice on the F7 square, G7 square, or H7 square. And this is against the black pieces, so it would be the opposite. Um, let's say that I was black and I was trying to attack the king side of white, then it would be the F2 square, the G2 square, or the H2 square. Normally, those are the squares where the pawns are in front of the king. And looking for sacrifices on those squares will get you far because you want to make the opponent's king naked. Literally, naked. Have you ever seen Rush Hour when, like, they strip the guys from their clothes and they have to, like, run around in a, on the streets in a highway naked? That's what you want to do to their king, okay? You want to strip them naked <laughs> from their pawns. Not literally, just in chess, okay? There's The king doesn't have clothes anyway. They're, they're plastic. But anyway, <laughs> hopefully you get that point. So when you're thinking of a piece attack, remember those key points, you know? Usually these attacks begin with a sacrifice and etc. cetera. Um, if you need to, like, remember it some more, just repeat um, this episode and... I will go over it again. You know, that's that's how simple I can make this. Um, now, a pawn attack. Let's start with that. So a pawn attack, a.k.a. pawn storm against your opponent's king. This is when you're, you start off your attack on your opponent's king with pawns. Usually, these attacks are often for closed positions. When the center is closed, when you still have your E and D pawn, and your opponents still have their E and D pawn, and they basically stopped each other, those are closed positions in the center. Because when the center is closed, then you have a good opportunity to attack on a flank. And usually you attack on a flank starting with a pawn storm, a pawn break. That's what you need. You know, let's say you have like a position, a position of, um, let's say like a French defense position. You have a pawn on e5, you have a pawn on d4, and your opponent has a pawn on e6 and d5, right? Usually a good like pawn break to have and going against the French defense is pushing up the f pawn at f4, f5, breaking through and attacking the king. So that's what I mean by a pawn storm against the castle king. So usually these attacks are often for close positions. It takes a lot more patience to set up this attack. So you need bundles of time. What I what do I mean by this? Well, when you're setting up a pawn storm attack, you want to make sure that all of your pieces are behind the pawn storm. Are ready to attack when everything opens up. Because you don't want to just throw pawns at your opponent's king, then yeah, that's that's pointless because pawns can't do it alone. They're they're one point for a reason. So you have to have a lot of patience. You have to have a lot of patience to set up this attack. And maybe you should set up a a, um, a battery behind the pawn break, you know? Um, it kind of goes back to that principle of having four to five pieces ready. So you, sh you should have basically four to five pieces behind the pawn storm to deliver a powerful attack. So if you have a pawn chain directed to your opponent's king, right? And that's usually when a pawn storm happens. Okay? And a pawn chain is when a long chain of pawns that are protecting each other is kind of diagonal um, on the chessboard. And usually they point directly where you should be attacking. Usually it's on the queen side, the pawn chain, or usually it's on the king side. So there are more tips, uh, and um, I can add, I can like give you some more tips, but you're gonna have to wait until the next segment. So yeah, let's get down, <laughs> let's get down to business. Yes, sir. Let's get down to business. And we're going to be talking about some more tips on attacking the castle king. 
Wasn't that just an awkward pause? Okay, let's get started. So, when you're looking at your opponent's castle king, look for weaknesses. Now, a weakness of your opponent's castle king could be every pawn pushed up in front of your opponent's castle king. You know why it could be a weakness? Because they could be a target for an attack. So, we just talked about the two type of ways to attack a castle king, which is a pawn attack or a peace attack. So, with a peace attack, you could do multiple sacrifices on the pawn that was pushed up. So, let's say Black had the h6 pawn pushed up. You can do a bishop sacrifice on an h6 um, pawn. And then, if you follow it up with that queen, then it's all good. You got the queen against the naked king, and it's all over once you get another piece in the mix. With the pawn attack, you could target that h6 pawn with just pushing, like, let's say that h6 pawn is up, and then you put that h pawn Hector on h5, and then you just slide through with that g pawn with, like, a battery on that g file, and then you push through with that g5 move attacking that h6 move and they're forced to either capture or let you capture and that's the type of weaknesses that we're going for when we're attacking the castle king now when people picture oh snap i castled i'm safe don't think that you're safe all the time i've already said that because even if the pawns aren't pushed does not mean that you're not going to be attacked if you're if you're doing like a pawn storm against your opponent's king, you can still have an attack. It's just going to take a few moves longer. So that's why when I say if you're going to attack on a flank, make sure that the center is closed and make sure that your opponent don't have any sacrifices to open up the center. If you're doing a long winded attack, especially if your opponent don't have any obvious weaknesses, just like any pawn push. So look at ways to loosen up the opponent's defense. For example, if your opponent has a fee and kettle position surrounding their king, and let me just explain what a fee and kettle is. A fee and kettle is a powerful way to develop your bishops and control the center of the board from a distance. So think about a castle king with pawns in front of it, but the middle one is up. So let me be more specific. So instead of the pawns in front of the king being f2, g2, h2, and this is from the white side, instead of the pawns just being like that, it would be f2, g3, h2 with the bishop on g2 on the long diagonal, on the long diagonal of the h1 to a8 diagonal. So one good way to attack the fiend kettle position is by pushing the end pawn, pushing Hector against that castled king to loosen up the position. Because what is the weakness of a of a fee and kettle position? It's that g3 pawn. That g3 pawn is pushed up because the bishop is on g2. So if you loosen up the position with that Hector pawn, the h pawn, and the same on the other side, vice versa. Like a fiat kettle can happen on queen side, king side, and on black or white side. So pushing up the end pawns is a good way to target um, that fiat kettle position. Okay? And that's like a, a tip, a secret. So if you want to get like an awesome attack off and you already have four to five pieces surrounding your uh, opponent's king and you're all ready and then you don't feel like sacrificing a piece push up Hector or push up the a pawn which is Ari you know push up Ari <laughs> oh man another thing you should probably consider is is your opponent naked and I already talked about this but let's talk deeply about if your opponent is naked okay <laughs> sounds weird but you know I'm talking about the opponent's kink is there space around your opponent's king? Can you take advantage of that space? What color bishop do you have? Let's say you was targeting your opponent's position and they have the fee and kettle structure, right? But they have the f2, g3, h2 structure without the bishop on g2. They lost the bishop. They, they already traded off the bishop. 
So the space around the king is a little bit airy without that bishop. That's why you should like try not to to never trade that off. So in order for you to take advantage of that space where that phoenix of bishop was supposed to be at, you have to have the same color bishop that they just lost. And if you have that combo with that bishop and queen, then it's all over on G2. So look for lines to target your opponent. And if there isn't any, create some. Create any diagonal, any horizontal file. No, not horizontal. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Horizontal rank, any vertical, vertical file. And you're you're good. You're good. If you create any of those, then you're good. Especially if you have a lot of pieces surrounding your opponent's king. Just imagine your opponent castle their king. They think they're all safe. Let's say they have all the pawns on h7, g7, f7. But you sacrifice and you created a file. And now they're missing a G pawn. Well, guess what you guess what you should have been prepared for? To have those rooks and queen on that G file so that you could take advantage of that file when you open up. Because before you sacrifice, you should have about four to five pieces already ready to attack. And I'm gonna keep on saying that so it could be drilled inside your head that you have to prepare and be ready to attack. Don't just do it prematurely. And we already talked about that in the past episodes. Don't do a premature attack because a premature attack is not a successful attack. So, how much defense does your opponent have? That's another thing you should be thinking about. Remember that there are two sides of the board and they're split in the middle. There's a king side and the queen side. That's why they say the king side castle and the queen side castle. Because there's two hemispheres of the chessboard. If your opponent is on the king side, you need to count how many defenders they have on the king side. Knowing this will give you a good reason to attack your opponent's king. Because if they don't have a lot of defenders, and actually you have more attackers than their defenders, then you can so-called gauge that you're going to have a successful attack. But if they have a whole bunch of defenders, and you have less attackers than their defenders on the king's side, and you're trying to attack their king that's castled over there, it most likely would not work out. And that's a good thing to think about. How many defenders do they have to protect their king? If it's just a rook, then game on. All I need is like two bishops and a knight and queen. And then let's just slap a rook just because. And sometimes you can trade off their defenders so that their king will be even more naked. And that's where attacking becomes fun. Attacking is only fun, though, when you finish the game. And that's why I'm here to to teach you how to finish the game. So let's talk about the last thing, the difference between castling on the same side, then on the opposite side. And I'm probably going to have to devote a whole nother episode on opposite side castling because it's going to be pretty um, specific. Like, I mean, not specific, general. To go more specific, I would have to devote a whole nother episode. But same side castling it could be less action more positional play and it's harder to attack your opponent especially if the position is open and not closed and usually same side castling is a lot more safe and opposite and opposite side castling a war just started once you opposite side castle and it's action packed i mean just think about it <clears throat> think about it once you opposite side castle your rook is already on the file to attack. Queenside castling is meant to attack. It's meant to be more tactical. And it's meant for both of you to attack at the exact same time. And most likely, most of them is usually pawn storms on both sides. 
or it could be a peace attack too. Some some games are like that, but most of the games that you will play, both sides are pushing pawns uh, against each other to try to defend and attack at the same time. And whoever delays their attack, even one move, then they're cut off. They're gone. There's nothing that they can do because guess what? There's no space on the board that's safe when you queenside when you queenside castle and your opponent kingside castle. It's a battle royale. You know what Fortnite is. You know what a battle royale is. Everybody's against each other. <clears throat> that's what it is. Chess is basically Fortnite. <laughs> oh man. I I will go more into that in a different episode, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it on um cast on attacking the castle king okay and i i'll probably warn y'all pretty soon but i want to do more videos more educational videos on my patreon so that y'all can get like a um more of a grasp a visual grasp on how to do certain patterns to attack the opponent's king because that's really what's going to help you but this episode will help you too you know on generally attacking and hopefully i know a lot of you talk to me and i know a kid told me that they finally beat their dad and brother with my advice so hey if if i'm able to do that for you bring you that value then that's great <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> oh man these are some good times and it's almost been a year since i did this this is so crazy Man, H1 is with y'all forever. (laughs) We got down to business. I'm glad we did. (laughs) This is the waiting room segment. Chess quotes by H1. And the quote of today is, Have more than four to five pieces to attack your opponent's king. Okay? If you want to have a successful attack, it's best to have four to five pieces to attack your opponent's king. (laughs) Thank you for listening. Okay, that was it. Hopefully y'all enjoyed that. I'm proud of you. I'm proud that you're here to just 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 let me thank you for being here. I'm glad that you can just be here to soak up this compliment that H1 is giving you right now. And you know what? You know what? I love you. Yeah, we're both uncomfortable now. I love you. <laughs> Oh man, you know H1 can get pretty crazy sometimes. But anyway, um, man, we're almost to the end of this season already. That's crazy. It's been a journey. It's been long. It's been great. But this next episode will be the last episode for this season. We had fun. We talked about rap skills that I used to have. We we talked about health, how that benefits you. This this season's been lit. And you know what? If you want to follow this season a lot more and make sure that you're notified, make sure that you follow. I know you're on Spotify, Apple Music, but make sure that you follow to stay notified. I want you to be here. (laughs) I want you to be here for my last episode for the season. So please... Please make it. Make it through. (laughs) Yeah, make it through. Okay. We're going to be running it back with another episode next time. Peace.